I'd like to start off with introductions. So my name is Eva, as mentioned. I work on various projects in the Ethereum ecosystem and super close with DeFi. Um, and maybe if you guys can start and say what you're working on and how that relates to stable coins. Sure. Yeah. Uh, sure. So I'm uh, Victor Rortbed. I work with the Ardi project. Uh, and for those of you that aren't familiar, it's an open source, uh, nonprofit money Lego protocol that was created by Francesco Renzi and Miao Zichang earlier this summer. Um, it's sort of uh, one sentence pitch is programmable interest payments. It takes DAI as the underlying asset and it invests in uh, no loss um, lending pools like Compound, DYDX, or Fulcrum and then takes that interest that's streaming back to the user account and allows the user that holds the die to direct that interest outside of their own account. So you can use it to pay um, for services, you can direct it to charities, open source projects, um, and for me it, it kind of constituted a my third fall down the rabbit hole in, in crypto. So the first one is the one everybody talks about when you first understand Bitcoin and you come out the other end and you start saying things like fiat money instead of dollar bills. Um, and then my second trip down the rabbit hole was learning about MakerDAO, understanding how those kinds of uh, systems, which seem incredibly complex, can result in this really wonderful um, system that, that opens up all kinds of new affordances for human financial behavior. And then the money Legos that are built on top of it uh, are, are fascinating. And so when I, when I heard about Ardai, I started building on it. And I recognized that it's not only a cool money Lego, but it actually kind of inverts <laughs> Um, a cognitive bias that, or sort of circumnavigates a cognitive bias that we've always had whenever we pay for things out of pocket, which is loss aversion. It doesn't feel good to see your number go down in your bank account, and so anything you pay for, you have to overcome that obstacle. So our die, when you can direct interest to things that you support, seems to alleviate some of that loss aversion. And it thinks, and you know, kind of gets me spinning thinking about the different possibilities that uh, you can build out a payment system and a payment network. Um, that is an entirely different structure with a lot more fluidity and a lot more um, possibility for supporting things that we think of now as these kinds of you need to add support models or surveillance capitalism to support. But with a directed interest micropayment kind of platform like Ardai, um, you really do have some, some really neat models that can come out of that. So I'm excited to build. It's not on mainnet yet, but that'll be a couple of months away. Um, so I encourage everybody to check it out. Hopefully you maybe fall down the same rabbit hole I did. Yeah, I'm Rune Christensen, I'm the CEO of the Maker Foundation, and for those of you that didn't hear it, yesterday we just announced that the full version of, of DAI, multi-collateral DAI, that also includes the DAI savings rate, uh, is launching on November 18. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Dan Robinson. I'm a research partner at uh, Paradigm, which is a crypto asset investment firm, but I'm here representing my own views um, and not those of the fund. Uh, I, I mostly work on uh, sort of research in, in uh, cryptocurrency and DeFi and recently published a paper called The Yield Protocol, um, which is about a way to do essentially secured zero coupon bonds um, on Ethereum. So, for example, one Y DAI um, is, is redeemable for one DAI um, at a particular future date and is secured by some, say, ETH collateral. Um, so unlike, unlike uh, uh, DAI, unlike, unlike, uh, it's, it's not uh, perpetual, and it's also not meant to target stability. So um, it's a way to get, so what happens is the, the Y DAI trades with some discount, and you can infer from the discount what the implied interest rate is that the market sets on this particular um, uh, maturity of, uh, of debt. And so it's, it's a protocol essentially for interest rate discovery on Ethereum. Awesome. So something that's been really exciting that came out of this world of DAI that Maker has uh, created is all these derivatives like RDAI, LSDAI, CDAI. Uh, but a lot of that has to do with uh, the interest rate that uh, people can earn, right? So these opportunities that, for example, InstaDAP is creating arbitrage between a Maker CDP and lending on Compound. Um, but how do you guys see interest rates evolving as our ecosystem evolves? And maybe, Dan, we'll start with you, given why tokens are a little bit relevant to that. Sure. So, yeah. So, so um why they obviously they haven't been implemented yet, um, but once you do, uh, just from sort of the market on chain, you can get what the markets uh, just for the prices of various maturities. You can uh, infer what the market predicts the term structure of interest rates will be, which is the future, basically the future path of interest rates. I think if you did that now, and this is a very sort of unjustified opinion, I think it would be an inverted yield curve in that I think people think that the current yields um, are are going to go down in the future. Um, 
That would be that would be probably my guess. Maybe I'm not sure if the other panelists would disagree. Yeah, I, I mean, I I really have no. Actually, we talked about it yesterday, and like, I really have no idea of what the yield curve would look like if there was one. And also, I think it would be really difficult to even construct one, right? Because we need to have a lot more liquidity in the ecosystem. And maybe once we do get to that level of liquidity, um, the, the, you know, the economy has stabilized a little bit. And, and who knows, it will still be inverted. Though I actually agree with you right now that rates do seem to be going down. And, um, and so to the question of like, these, these yields are critical for, for all of these like derivative assets. Um, what I think is really interesting is that with the, with the DAI savings rate that DAI is going to add now, this will be the first time in DeFi that you can get a type of yield that doesn't add any additional risk to the underlying stablecoin. And, um, and yeah, and I think that will really open up for even more types of, of um, innovation like this, or at least it will make people feel a lot more safe doing it. Because for instance, if you wanted to use something like RDAI and donate it to charity, um, if you're using Compound right now, you actually are like, like you're not just donating money to charity for free because you are taking some risk and there is some real non-zero risk that you could, you could end up with a loss because of Compound um, having like a, you know, not being able to cover liquidation. And that's where the die savings rate is, is really interesting in that it, you know, um, there really is no downside to, to like sending it out. So it really is like free money in a way that you can also give away and really have no sense or no, no possibility of, of a loss. Right. So yeah, also, I, this is not the boxing match part of the panel. This is not what we're <laughs> going to be really fighting with each other. I agree that the rates are artificially high now because of all kinds of uh, sort of one-time or um, you know, ecosystem issues with the platform risk, um, smart contract risk with compound being uh, unreliable and the, the fact that um, die savings rate is coming out, I think we're gonna see a massive kind of paroxysm in those kinds of rates and things will stabilize in you know, a number of months, if not years. Uh, but I don't think that this is sustainable um, at the, the current levels, but I think that there still is a very high probability that these DeFi technologies will enable you know, some sort of above uh, inflation type uh, interest rates that, um, that could be quite useful for building these protocols. Awesome. Yeah, I think something that's cool and sort of the elephant in the room is that the maker stability fee almost acts like a LIBOR today. Um, and so people started debating, you know, how is the compound lending interest rate dictated? And really, that's probably in proxy to what maker stability fee is today. Um, maybe, Rune, you could speak a little more to how the DSR will be decided and how the stability fee has also been decided lately, just for those in the room who aren't aware of that process. Yes. Yeah, so, right, so the maker stability fee is what you have to pay right now. Uh, in order to generate DAI by putting a collateral into to Maker. And um, it started out at a half percent when DAI launched two years ago. And it stayed stable at a half percent for like, I think almost a year, like very close, like in very, it that stayed at a very low rate for almost a year. And then suddenly, um, last spring, it just like shot up and became, like hit a high point of, of 20 and a half percent, I think. And the reason why it changes at all um, is because it's actually, so it's MKR holders, it's a governance of Maker that decides what the stability fee is. And they have like these weekly decision making process that sets a new one every week. But that decision is made entirely based on data uh, on the price of DAI in the market. Because what you use rates for is you really use that to stabilize the DAI stablecoin itself and make it as stable against the US dollar as possible. Uh, and this is actually analogous to how central banks that, that manage a pegged currency, they have to always modify their rates so that they can keep their pegs. Um, um, and the, really the very basic logic is that if, you're like, if you want your currency to go up in value, you have to increase the rates. In Maker, um, what happened was that around uh, spring this year, the die price suddenly fell below, like fell to like 96 cents or something. And what was happening is too many people were taking advantage of the fact that they could borrow die very cheaply and then sell it for more ETH and then get like better exposure to ETH. So the response of the governance was to then just increase the rate until people stopped stop borrowing that much die, right? And 
Um, so basically, like, the, the supply was going up too much, demand was only like staying at this level, I guess you could say, right? And then the high rates like, pushed the supply back down to be in line with demand so that the price could remain stable. Um, so, and what's happening now is the rates are going back down, and that's basically, actually, I think, because of this new dimension of dye demand where people buy dye so that they can put it into compound, into like these derivative dye type of products. And that itself is then dragging the rates down. And there, I think that really shows the whole, the nature of the, uh, the feedback loop. Mm -hmm. That like, as there's more demand for CDPs and the more demand for, for borrowing because the rate is so low, the rate automatically goes up. And now there's all this demand for compound and like for all of these um, ways to earn an in, like a, a return on your, on your, on your stable coins, and those rates then go down. And I think once we get in the die savings rate, and once the ecosystem matures a bit more, <coughs> we might finally get to a point where the rates in general start being a bit more stabilized. Because I think really the whole journey we've been through, like this extremely high, like extremely low rates to extremely high rates, and then coming back down, that is like exactly what you would expect from like a brand new economy, right? Like it doesn't really, People are kind of like making, having the wrong assumptions sometimes and like trying ex extrapolating the wrong things. And over time, as some of the market goes through this like learning process, things should stabilize a lot more. Agreed. I think that some of the factors that dictate that are ETH price, maker decision making, and then also organic demand for DAI that will dictate the, these interest rates. But Dan, in your protocol, like what uh, variables were you taking into account when you were building your yield curve? Sure, yeah, so um, it's funny that there's a panel of stable coins because basically the, the defining feature and the useful feature about Y tokens um, is that they're not stable. So um, Maker, you know, uh, through, through a really, really sort of ingenious mechanisms, uh, managed to achieve these two things, perpetuity and stability, that are really necessary to have a, a, a decentralized dollar on chain. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm buttering Rune up now because I think we're gonna, we're gonna come to blows a little more uh, <laughs> later on in, in the talk. Uh, I think, um, what Y token does is just, it just abandons those. It says this is no longer perpetual, it's, uh, and we're not going to target stability. But as a result, you actually get, um, by, by removing these, these parameters from, from the system uh, and just letting the price float freely, you actually get the market to tell you what it thinks the interest rate is uh, for this particular tenor. Um, and I think that's, that's useful. It's useful potentially as an input into systems like Maker or Compound to help inform their um, formulas or governance decisions. Um, and I think it's potentially useful for somebody looking for a fixed term um, loan for a good amount of time. But, uh, but ultimately, you know, it depends, I think, on having this kind of rock-solid unit of account like DAI uh, is becoming. Interesting. I feel like this is the time that we should switch gears. Uh, so the hot topic is multi-collateral DAI, uh, and so figuring out what is the process and what will be included. Um, and maybe, uh, Rune, if you have any uh, context you can provide about what we know of how the process is going to be bootstrapped, that might be useful. Yeah, so maker, maker governance is notoriously um, complex because we're really talking about like governance of a, of a full monetary system. So uh, we have this extremely dedicated core community that actually spent the time it takes to like, you know, follow all the, the sort of the, the, the most detailed research and actually even creating research themselves. So um, there is actually a very well um, like uh, thought out like, like base level theory around the whole the whole concept of how we're going to do maker governance and multilateral die um, that has been worked on for years at this point, and um, the foundation has then like contributed a lot to this conversation ourselves, and then ultimately also just seen like the, the organic conversation coming out of the community and all the ideas, uh, and then like formulated a very basic you know what we call like an interim kind of like just like an initial framework that's that should work for the very early stages, right? And, um, and, we're, and we're really just extrapolating what's already there, which is the, this weekly cycle that sets the rates in the system, and then creating a new monthly cycle because it's more, it, it deals with something more advanced. So it's going to be on a monthly basis. And actually, in addition to the already existing weekly cycle that will continue to exist, and that's how the rates will continue to be set mm -hmm. in, sort of the, in the short term. Um, but then in this, every monthly cycle, you have this like end-to-end -end process of like evaluating new collateral tokens and also evaluating existing collateral tokens. 
and seeing whether you want to onboard new collateral and, and also how you want to adjust the parameters for existing collateral types. And the goal is always to try to get as much like as broad discussion, as kind of like as, as rational and, and um, as little as possible of kind of like a popularity contest. So we actually try to, in a way, like actively uh, prevent MPI holders from having too much influence at the granular level. So it's just like, you know, whoever, whatever an MPI whale, like whatever random coin that they like gets like the special treatment, right? But instead having it all focused on like always getting a hold of the data and then applying like models that have already been agreed on and, and then through that coming to like this, this common understanding of how we can securely include new collateral types. Right. So essentially there's two facets to how you're deciding multi-collateral die. One is the degree of collateral. Um, something Victor said that was interesting is having different types of ETH, like ETH as the collateral but different collateral rates, and also the asset. Um, and so the fundamental question is, should we be including trusted assets in multi-collateral DAI? Uh, and I know there's a, bit of, there's a bit of controversy, so maybe we'll start with Dan and your perspective on that. Sure, yeah. So I think, um, uh, as you said, you know, uh, meter governance is, is an extremely uh, complex process. And right now, it's, as far as active governance decisions, it's basically just setting one number, right? And it's still, it's still like a rel relatively hard to get this right, and the mechanisms for it um, I think are still, are still sort of like being evolved and, and, uh, and improved. And so by, you know, by moving to multi-collateral die, as you, as, you, as you recognize, you know, like you're really sort of dramatically increasing the number of decisions that this, that this process has to, uh, has to make. And in my view, I think that, that quite possibly increases the risk um, uh, much more so than diversification maybe, uh, maybe reduces it. And then as, as Eva mentions, there's, there's, there's also this, um, there's risk, just you know, regulatory risk that comes in if you're starting to use uh, tokens that can be that can be frozen by a government, or uh, custodial risk if it's if it's something that's backed by um, uh, by an actual asset uh, being held by a, by a custodian. Um, but I, I think maybe most important to me, I think, is, is the model risk. It's just the idea: what if maker governance uh, isn't up to the task of evaluating um, the stability and, rel and sort of uh, relative risks of uh, a really diverse portfolio, portfolio of assets? And maybe it's worth talking about sort of. What you see as in the, in the um, future, these assets being, because I think it's not right. It's not just on chain assets, as Eva said. Um, and I think you know that's. I think that kind of risk is maybe what's scariest to me because that's that's the kind of thing that caused the 2008 financial crisis, where you know just the smartest people in the world um, had models that were fundamentally wrong, and things that they thought were like triple A rated debt were actually zeros. And that doesn't. I think that kind of going from going from valuable to just nothing. You see that happen a lot in these more complex instruments. I don't think that's likely to happen in a, in a simple asset like Ethereum. So that's why I'd say I think the, uh, when, you, when you see Ethereum drawdown, down, we saw a maker fantastically survived a 95% almost drawdown in the price of ETH. Um, when you see this happen, like, uh, it happens gradually enough that the, that the system actually is able to handle it through liquidations. Um, whereas again, if you were to have an event like the 2008 financial crisis, um, and a lot of this of sort of like, I don't know, like the kind of mortgages that you would have backing it, um, were to turn out to be zeros, uh, that seems like a, like a more likely to precipitate a crisis. Yeah, okay, so that was a lot of points, and <laughs> I'll try to like, I mean, I think really the, the fundamental point, or like one of the really crucial fundamental points is this like, this question of the complexity of, of governance and finance in general. And I mean, I think the most basic thing to understand is that that risk is, is always there, right? Like finance and, and money is just, incredibly complex. And just because you, because you ignore the complexity or don't address it, doesn't mean it goes away. Um, and, and there's actually no, like, when you think about like models and, and sort of like how to think about risk and so on, like the, the truth is exactly that like there's never, there's never like an, an, any way to kind of like solve this problem as in you just like make a good enough model or something like that and that's gonna like solve, solve the problem. In fact, sometimes, Thinking that you've, you know, the biggest risk is thinking that you've solved the problem of risk and now there's no longer any more risk, right? And in my opinion, there really is, there really is only sort of, um, like only one sort of like rock solid truth that you can grasp onto and that you can depend on. And that is that diversification helps with risk, right? That's because in the end, if you think about risk as like, you know, purely in terms of black swan events, so like that you never know if, whatever, Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or housing or anything. Like you never know if it's all just like 
a big lie and it's all, you know, it doesn't make sense at all and everyone was just getting really excited about something that really didn't make sense at all, right? Or whatever, there could be some hidden financial engineering build up that's gonna make it all pop or something like that, right? And if you assume that that could happen to anything and there's no way you can ever prevent that or like predict that, then the only way you can defend yourself is by making sure that you can survive that happening to, to like a piece of the portfolio of die, right? So that even if all real estate tanks completely, that shouldn't tank die, right? Or even if all of crypto goes to zero, that also shouldn't kill the system, right? Or, and, and the most important, like what you really want to achieve is like a, a situation where you can have several of these scenarios happening at the same time, sort of stacking on top of each other and the system can still survive. Because this, like the other critical point of this is like, is maker governance up to the task, right? Like maybe even though, you know, the foundation has obviously been very careful in how all the MCAO is distributed and, and, and really like, and in terms of like the, the models and sort of the model risk and like the, like just like the, the methodology, the focus has always been on trying to get experts from the traditional space, but like very, you know, very broadly and like very diversified, but ultimately like at least rely as much as possible on traditional models. So there's just, at least there's something already there that can then be built on top of. But even if that turns out to not work so well, um, the whole, like, the whole uh, concept of Maker is that when there is a loss, the MPI holders, they have to absorb that loss, right? And that actually creates this dynamic that over time you can see Maker as this like evolutionary system that um, rather than just like thinking really hard and like totally like solving risk and now it's not a problem anymore because we're so smart, which is unlikely to be how things play out, right? It'll be basically this like process of, of trial and error and like very real consequences of errors that then make it very clear that you know, it is, there's a big advantage to actually getting it right and, uh, and making sure that the system evolves in the right direction. I guess a, a concern for me in terms of trusted assets is if we were to play this out, right, let's say using tokenized real estate from, you know, uh, that was underwritten by an uh, investment bank like Goldman, um, you know, the financial crisis, the problem was these assets were misappropriately tagged, right? Um, and that's an incentive problem, really. These banks were more incentivized to do it incorrectly than, than accurately. And even if we have this very open decision-making, you know, transparent maker process, we aren't necessarily going to go all the way down to the way that that debt or real estate, the mortgage was issued. And so how do you see uh, that counterparty risk playing in or maker even maybe alleviating that? Like, are you going to start creating risk teams that go all the way downstream to how the asset was created uh, or simply at the level of what assets should be included in multi-collateral? Well, I certainly think that that exact problem is something where blockchain gives us the best shot ever at getting, you know, very granular data. Um, but I also, but actually, I think at, at such an important point, right, is that if you look at something like the financial crisis, it really was like the fundamental thing that went wrong was really greed, right, mm -hmm. and like and and like misaligned incentives, but more than that, really like greed and 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 bad culture, and. That's where I think, I mean, what Maker relies on in this aspect is like loss aversion, you know, like very, very basic psychology of like, yeah, you might be greedy, but then you're gonna get slapped with, you know, the entire loss that you create, right? Whereas the, the bankers, they knew that the government had to deal with the, the fallout, right? Which is this like horrible, uh, you know, like perfect storm of like greed and bad incentives and bad structure and so on, right? Um, but like, but actually, to, like the only way you can only like you always have to take it back to diversification. So like even if you, whatever, like solve greed or, or like you know have this like have this like um, you know at least like this clear consequence to being overly greedy, and um, and you also like dig all the way down and you get all the data about the specific assets and so on, you still have to always assume that you might be wrong regardless. So again, the only thing you can really do and you can sort of hold on to as being something that that, that uh, is very likely to work, is to, you know, don't depend too much on Goldman Sachs only, right? Make sure you also depend on all the other investment banks and also all the assets that don't even have anything to do with investment banks and commodities and so on and so on, right? And basically accept the fact that many times you're going to be wrong 
but you'll get to learn from those mistakes. And also, on a whole, if the portfolio is well enough diversified, it'll, you know, it'll just be absorbed and sort of be a part of the, the general process of the system. So I don't, I don't agree that, that we can potentially solve for greed here. I'm a little bit concerned that like, if that's what Maker is trying to do, that's, that's really running at an almost um, bigger target than, it, than a governance process could ever handle. And I guess I, I think of the financial crisis as motivated not so much by greed, but by opacity. Like we didn't know what those things were. We didn't know who owed what to who and how these things would compound. And so I think that the Maker process could potentially um, benefit so much from the fact that it's all on chain and that all the assumptions are on chain too, like how we're evaluating these assets, how we're looking at these things um, becomes a major difference in how the uh, 2008 financial crisis played out. And I think that that's my thought to, to your point, Dan. I mean, I think you're exactly right. There's no way the maker token holders can be doing the evaluation of each and every one of the decisions that come across, you know, that they're, they're sure here with, you know, what should we price this one person's mortgage at? But I think the idea, is that we have a lot more transparency and I think we build systems that over time start to have their own support networks and they don't fil they filter up in a way that maker uh, token holders are incentivizing them to filter up, right? If there's some sort of bounty for alerting the system, right? That's one way you could design a crypto economic incentive here for people to report up dangerous you know, flaws in some sort of model and, and it's a long process. I don't think we're getting there right away, but I think that's, that's the sort of long range view that it's not about making direct decisions, but kind of like how we're gonna do the process thing. And I think, like for me, the model is like Wikipedia. That's like the maker token holders have become the mods, but they're not the ones that are actually contributing all the actual data of like, this is what we're gonna look at here. And it's, it's a, you know, not perfect analogy, but I think it's one that is at least optimistic, right? That there is a way to do this kind of decentralized, um, you know, project that nobody really thought could work and generate a public good, in this case, information, in maker's case, you know, value. Um, but I guess I'm bullish, but I think that uh, we should be solving for transparency first. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be clear, I mean, I don't think that you can solve greed either. And that wasn't. I mean, it's a joke that like even if you solved it, that you still actually haven't fixed the problem, right? Because there's still stupidity and so on. But I mean, yeah, you can't can't solve stability. You can't solve greed. These are like natural human mm -hmm. uh, characteristics, right? But but you're totally right with transparency, with like proper incentives. And then, crucially, very strong transparency around those incentives, right, and around those consequences. You can at least, like, um, yeah, like, right, like, you can use people's self-interest towards something positive rather than, again, in the case with the financial crisis, the self-interest really was, like, just misaligned with the public interest entirely. I mean, Bear, Bear, Bear Stearns shareholders were incentivized, right, in the same way maybe that maker holders are, and, you know, it ends up being a zero. Um, I think, like, you know, all, all the banks potentially were, uh, you know, the, the equity shareholders that were wiped out um, or, or at, a, at a steep discount. Like, there, there were a lot of incentives there, but the problem is because of just the, just the inherent complexity, like you said, of finance, um, you necessarily have to delegate um, these kinds of uh, 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 decisions to, to, to experts. And ultimately, you know, that reintroduces the same principal agent problems that you, that you have in, uh, in big banks. Um, and yes, yeah, certainly, again, I think like a lot of the, of the individual actors maybe at those banks were, um, were not correctly incentivized to, to act in the best interest of um, ultimately the shareholders and then ultimately the stability of the system. Um, but that, I don't see how you get around that. And in fact, like in Maker, it may even, it may even be more dangerous because um, you have this risk that, the, that MKR shareholders, for example, could be, could be bribed um, in order to, uh, to make a decision that is maybe to the best interest of, uh, uh, of the attacker, but not um, and to, and to their best interest but isn't ultimately in the best interest of the, of the value of the system or the stability of the system. So you have, you have these new sort of, uh, you're introducing a lot of new principal agent problems there. And actually, these do exist in traditional finance. You can short it, you can short it, uh, or like do derivatives to uh, reduce your exposure to equity you own. But uh, if you, you know, this, this does end up like in some ways increasing, right, a lot of the indirectness that caused a uh, financial crisis. Yeah, okay, so there's, if you're making like two points here, right? Like, so let me, so the first one is that um, shareholders and banks had the same incentives that MKR holders have in the financial crisis, um, which I mean, which is, is true, right? And it, it, to some extent, it's how, like, it, on one hand, it's, it, it is how things are meant to play out, but I think also at the same time, e exactly if you look at like um, the way that that public companies are currently structured and like the way they exist in in society, like the framework itself actually recognizes that there really is a major disconnect between shareholders and 
the actual management of a of an organization. And even you know you often say that like there's like a fight between them, right? And they're using sort of legal means to always battle over the resources between each other, right? And I mean, if you what like I think the analogy of Wikipedia, like imagine if in the lead up to the financial crisis, you actually had the technology that allowed um, you know shareholders to get sort of like a clear visualization of what what you know what they were cooking up in there were like all those those derivatives and kind of like you know for instance just see something like um, what like what's our what's our level of, of diversification right like how much exposure do we have to to particular things right and then ultimately you know at a much more granular level individual decisions would have to be okay on a you know, on a, on a recurring basis with like a, you know, almost like an app or something, imagine like a shareholder app, where then they'll be like, okay, we're gonna do all these like new CDOs and we're doing them like, you know, like here's a video explaining how we're doing all these things. Yes or no, kind of right. Like that, I mean, I think if you imagine that type of scenario and especially with like blockchain technology and, and I guess also most crucially, like a very uh, focused education campaign as sort of like, you know, towards the shareholders. And, and combining all of these things together, I definitely think that you, you would have a much more higher likelihood of like, um, you know, catching something like this in the act. Um, so, okay, so that's, so that's like the, the, the first element of it, right? And then the second thing you're talking about, I think is very interesting, is like this attack of um, MPI holders can be bribed because, um, so now we're getting into crypto economic attacks, which is like a whole class of like, crazy things you have to think about when you do uh, DeFi and, and blockchain apps in general. Um, and Maker actually has a very strong defense against this entire class of attacks, really, right? Because what we are, like basically the, like what, we are, what we are getting into is like the point where MKI holders might decide that they're better off essentially abusing their ability to control the system for something else than keeping DAI stable, right? And typically, I mean, I think, like, the thing is, once you get into governance attack scenarios and crypto economic attack scenarios, you very quickly get into, let's try to steal all the collateral. So, Maker is, needs to be built so that it can, you know, even survive, like, every single, like, all the MKR holders colluding and saying, we're gonna, we're gonna steal all the collateral. And the basic, um, the basic defense is that there's always, like, a, a security delay on all governance decisions so that they can be scrutinized to see whether um, you know, whether, uh, like, is this actually, like, a decision that's just getting pushed through, completely circumventing the, the governance framework and circumventing all, like, the transparency and, and all the, sort of, the, you know, the data-driven models that are supposed to drive governance? And if, and if that's the case, it very likely is an attack. And then, in the, in the worst-case scenario, what you actually do is that you, you, um, you actually, like, do what's called an emergency shutdown. So you shut down the system entirely, and then you take the attacker's MKR, and you, you can, like once you have the system shut down, you can remove the attacker's MKR entirely. You redeploy the system, and do like a migration process that's qu quite similar to how the upgrade to multi-collateral die will work now. And this is a very extreme scenario, but it really is like, I mean, the, the mechanism has to be there because of course it would never work if you could just like, you know, steal a collateral or like, damage the system just because you, you, you control um, MKR voting power. So I think we have about 10 minutes left, and I think this is a good time to open up the floor for any questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please come up to the mic up here. If you don't have any questions, we can continue. Yeah, one victim. Good morning. Um, I have a question regarding the migration and the deprecation of the first uh, single collateral buy. And I've asked around a few times, and mo most of the time the answer comes down to the overhead of having two systems to manage. And I personally find that it's somewhat of a weak argument considering the amount of money involved. And I feel uncomfortable with the fact that the system would eventually be forcefully deprecated versus the market choosing which version of DAI they prefer. Yeah, and, so, and, and just a clarifying question. So are you specifically talking about that you think it, is, it would be desirable to have a version of DAI that is backed only by ETH? Correct. Yeah, so I mean, so, so the first part of the question, right, it's really like, um, the thing is that there are, there are 
level of like security measures and especially crypto economic defense solutions built into the multilateral DAI code base. That just means that over time, it really makes no sense to hold on to like to single collateral DAI. Even I mean, even though single collateral DAI, it's it's been incredibly security tested, right? It's been battle tested for years at this point. Um, but you know, the multi collateral DAI code base is actually older than the single collateral DAI code base. Like multi collateral DAI has gone through this incredibly long, like multi year research and development process that has produced like some, you know, like code with a level of of sort of security as like um, principles that are you know an order of magnitude better than what you have in single collateral DAI. So from a technical perspective, it really is like it, if, I mean, if you want to look at like a time scale of decades, it really makes a lot more sense to rely on the MCD code base. But then to the second point about their, the fact that there might be demand for, for a stable coin that's only backed by ETH. I mean, this is something that we, um, we that started really coming up in the community once, a, like basically a broader group that just like the people who are involved in maker governance started realizing that maker governance had for years been you know, figuring out how can we scale the DAI supply and how we needed real world assets for that. Um, and this, a solution that was proposed by, I mean, actually some, some guy on Twitter um, in, in this conversation was that because Maker will support synthetic assets anyway, right? So there'll also be like a Euro stable coin and Maker governance can actually create whatever kind of synthetic asset they want. That means they could also create a new asset, so like a new single collateral die, which then like, like uh, right now I refer to that as a purity die, right? So like, an, like a new stable coin that's backed only by ETH, but using the multi-collateral die framework, so it has all those advantages of security and also something like the, you know, the die savings rate and the, that's kind of, you know, these kind of like the, the full set of features. Um, and so I think that if there really turns out to be a critical mass of demand for that, then um, it'll be trivially easy for maker governance to, to like create a follow-up to single collateral DAI. And then another thing to consider is a single collateral DAI will actually continue to run in the background for quite a while, um, even after the multi collateral DAI launches. Although much of liquidity will probably immediately move to multi collateral DAI, like it's not gonna be f like forcefully go away immediately. So they should, like they should, I think in the end, as long as the, there's enough demand there, it'll be possible for people to, to stay with the kind of stable coin they want. And if I, if I understand the way the system works correctly, I think you are free to make a proposal to the maker multi-collateral die system to make this single collateral ETH-based one. So, you know, it's not something that you have to rely on maker making that call, you can also participate. Thank you. Cool. If there are any other questions, uh, I guess if we are simulating a world where we are using off-chain assets, which assets would we use? Um, and, and maybe we have different perspectives on that. I mean, I think the bit, like, uh, I think what's cool to look at is the, act, like, the actual uh, proposals and actual, like, uh, collaborations that the foundation, at least, has been, been looking at recently. Um, and, okay, one really cool example is Paper Chain. So this is, a, like, a blockchain startup that's tokenizing royalties for, like, um, like music artists that are selling music on Spotify. Uh, and they are, and, and, and if you're not like a, a really big shot uh, musician, you, you actually have a lot of issues with like, how do you even like finance your, your you know, like your near recording and all this stuff. Um, and and they were, I don't think that, like they were not very good infrastructure for people who, um, who weren't like at the very high level. And so this startup is trying to solve that issue by enabling them to tokenize, you know, the claim on their, on their future royalties for something like Spotify. And, and then this asset can actually, like, and that's actually gonna be like a digital EC20 token that will fit straight into, into Maker. Um, and I think, that, I think that's like a really cool example of like some very, you know, very like out there like type of, of exposure that is incredibly, you know, it's like, it creates a lot of diversity, obviously, compared to something like just having it all be real estate or having it all be crypto. Um, but then beyond that, I mean, real estate, there's, there's several startups that are trying to figure out how to get, how to like get real estate into multiple adult die over, you know, I mean, it's a long journey because of all the regulation that's involved, of course. Um, and the same goes for, um, 
for trade finance. And there's actually also, and I think this is pretty cool, there's like Fluidity, the creators of uh, AirSwap. They have completely on their own, without any sort of, like without any sort of collaboration or involvement from the, from the Mega Foundation, create their own, like their whole like own stack and, and proposal and kind of like approach of how they want to introduce uh, T-bills as collateral, mm. especially in order to like generate sufficient liquidity for DAI and like enable it to like scale in a much more elastic fashion when there's like big swings in the market. Right. That's really interesting. Dan, did you have a perspective? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think um, real estate, I certainly see the demand for borrowing against real estate, but uh, I think there's, you know, there's, there's very clear sort of like systemic risks around it. And in fact, I think like, you know, practically every credit crisis ever has, all, has been driven by some kind of real estate bubble and borrowing against and leveraging real estate. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, so I think there's, there's that risk. Um, and again, I, I understand the points about, uh, about diversification, but ultimately, like, quite often when such a crisis happens, um, it hits the whole sector, uh, it hits everything. What, weirdly enough, I think, again, like, like when you, if, you, if you actually just start tied to, a, to an asset like Ether, um, I think we've seen that even like, sort of a dramatic fall in the price of Ether over the course of a year was, um, was, was perfectly fine for a single collateral buy. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I think, I don't think we've ever seen a case where you've had like a commodity, um, a commodity crash like that fast, or have a, a, a crisis or a or a uh, boom or a, or a bubble uh, driven just by like a single commodity's price. And so I, again, I, I think that's uh, part of I suppose my argument for why uh, uh, it's sort of arguably not diversifying at all makes more sense from a risk perspective. Yeah, and I think it's a good point that most um, credit bubbles in the past have been based on real estate. And it's, I mean, I also think what's especially interesting to look at is how the financial crisis was really this example of like a crash that really, where it really, you know, it wasn't like the Ethereum crash that died survived, right? It really was like a one to zero type of crash. Um, but I mean, there are also examples of crashes that had nothing to do with real estate. And I think the one that's most relevant for crypto is obviously the dot-com crash, right? <laughs> and, and, here, and, like, and the thing is, the problem with tying DAI only to ETH and like creating a stable coin and creating like a monetary system that's based only on like a, you know, something that is a, like it's a little bit equivalent to like a, a tech stock, right? Like, I mean, like a, a, a tech asset, right? Is that what you're essentially doing is you're like taking it, I mean, okay, this is very, very simplified, right? But imagine if you took the same dynamic of like CDOs and derivatives upon derivatives upon derivatives that had been applied to real estate in the financial crisis. Imagine if that had somehow been applied to like tech stocks in the dot-com bubble, right? Like, cause, and because then that would have, could possibly have been even more insane and, and violent than, than the dot-com bubble already was, right? So in the end, I mean, I think this dynamic of like, and, and well, actually, I think a really critical point is that like, things only really go, ever go wrong when finance kind of like starts putting the cart before the horse, right? And that's the, that's the problem with, with a decentralized stablecoin or like a single collateralized stablecoin is that um, it works great when ETH is kind of like driving the, the show, right? And, and like DAI is kind of like relying on ETH for its value. But if we end up in a situation where ETH is suddenly being like propped up by DAI because DAI is now like this big monetary system and it's creating all this like, um, it's, it's channeling all this credit into Ethereum, and, and that way you actually end up with it, like with the DAI driving the Ethereum price instead of Ethereum like driving or like, or like stabilizing the DAI price. Then that's when uh, if, the, if the market starts turning and the Ethereum price starts falling or if just the DAI supply starts shrinking because it turns out there's a better stable coin or something like that, that's when you can get what's referred to as a death spiral where you know, as the Ethereum price falls, the DAI supply shrinks because of liquidations and because the DAI, like DAI is driving the ETH price, as the DAI supply shrinks, ETH falls even more. And that's when you can get that kind of like zero, like one to zero 2007, where real estate turns out to be worthless type of scenario. And again, there, I mean, the only known way to deal with this is to assume that it'll happen at some point and diversify as much as possible. 
So a happy medium, the way I'm seeing that is, you know, you can diversify and also maybe have on-chain assets when we can have other uh, crypto assets on Ethereum. So things like TBTC, once that's live, that might be really interesting to put in multi-collateral DAI. Um, I think our time is up, so thank you all for joining us this early morning uh, and hope you can follow the multi-collateral DAI process. Thank you. Thank you.